We are in the middle of uh, what has been defined the artificial intelligence revolution. As Andrew Ng, uh, one of the most prominent researchers and scientists in AI put it, AI is going to transform industry and businesses as electricity did uh, roughly one century ago. And we have already experienced unprecedented success when using AI in different applications, ranging from computer vision to speech recognition, robotics and healthcare. We have built cars that can make sense of the world around them by identifying other cars, objects, pedestrians, traffic signs, and so on. We can talk uh, with our preferred assistants on different mobile devices uh, or, or, or the computers themselves. And how is that became, become possible uh, through the evolution of the field of AI? If we look back at the history of AI, starting from the 50s, what has essentially constituted a paradigm shift in this field is the idea of rather than trying to mimic human reasoning, scientists have started to understand that you, we can build machines that, are, that emulate human intelligence by just learning from thousands of examples and millions of input data points. So the idea here is that we can provide many examples of different types of data, for instance, images, and we can then learn what a cat he is or what a dog he is by just looking at and making sense of this type of data. Why is this happening now, in, uh, starting from the early 2000s? The reason is that essentially we have now the availability of collecting huge data sets. You can think of the internet and all the data it contains. Nowadays, this is really accessible from um, different perspectives and we can download a lot of information from there. And also the evolution of the computing power that we have nowadays. We can use many different uh, computers. We can run computations in parallel, scaling to uh, thousands and millions of machines by using, for instance, cloud infrastructures. And we also have dedicated hardware that can speed up the computation uh, and the um, ability of this technology to um, make sense of data. One clear example of how can, we can exploit this um, availability of data sets happened in 2010 with the uh, idea that Professor Fei Fei Li from Stanford with the Air Team had of building the largest collection of uh, images uh, to date. The underlying idea that they had was basically to uh, query the search engines from, from the internet and collect many different examples of more than a thousand classes. So what they did uh, practically was they query search engines searching for images of different types of dogs, cats, and other thousand classes. You can think of different cars, trucks, and so on and so forth. So they collected all these images and stored them in a database, which is called ImageNet. And then we had also human validating the labels and the content of these images. So this was also so, uh, done as a second step. So what, what they did was to collect this um, huge data set of images with, along with their descriptions. And then they challenged the research community to solve the problem of building machines that can understand what the images contain. And the idea is that the algorithms should try to predict the class of the image, so whether there is a dog, a truck, or whatever object you can think of, within the first top five best predictions. And now, if we look historically what happened, starting from 2010 up to 2017, you can see that at the beginning, at the, beginning the error of these machines was about 28 and 26 percent. And then in 2012, a paradigm shift occurs. So we had a new system called AlexNet that was able to decrease the error by almost 10 percent. So what changed here is that Rather than trying to have engineers tell the machines what to look into images, which is the traditional way we used to build computer vision systems, so something like uh, we try to tell the machine, look at the color distribution of the image, or look at these salient points in the figure, what changed was that 
the algorithm now tries to understand by itself what to look inside the image to make sense of the data and improve the predictions. So is the is, is it, it's left to the algorithm to understand whether to look at the colors, which kind of features or salient characteristics from the image uh, it has to look at. And this, um, in, since 2012, we have this mechanism implemented via what is called uh, deep learning or deep neural networks. That's the main technology that is used nowadays for that. And there's no uncrafted process behind that, but it's the machine learning directly from raw data. So from the raw image pixels, for instance. And as you see, as this technology developed over and over, the error constantly decreased over time, up to the point that such machines were able to surpass human performance, which was rated 5% on this data set. This is a bit debatable, but we have to understand that this 5% for humans uh, mostly arises from the fact that humans are not very good at distinguishing different species of uh, animals or flowers, or, so we are not very good at knowing all these thousand different types of images that we should discriminate for this data set. Whereas machines can store and can have much more memory than us, so for, for them, the task is easier. So that's why they get this superhuman performance. Now, and, and then given that these methods exhibit superhuman performance, now we should ask ourselves whether they really learn like humans or not. And to make a long story short, the answer is clearly no, because for instance, humans do not learn from different million examples of the same thing. So we don't learn to recognize a chair because we saw a thousand chairs. And we make sense of the world in a very different way than what machines do. There is also a very simple test that we can show to demonstrate that machines learn different things from what humans look at when, when learning about objects and new classes. And this is something we have demonstrated back in 2013, and then it became very popular after a team from Google Brain showed essentially the same phenomenon. So what you can do is, for instance, considering the image that you see here, which is the image of a school bus, you can show that this image, if you feed it to one of these algorithms, like AlexNet or similar ones, the state-of-the-art models for image recognition, well, the algorithm will correctly predict that this image contains a school bus with a certain, let's say, probability or confidence level. Here you have 94%. What you can do is actually show that by adding a small perturbation to every pixel of the image, and add it to the original image, you get a new modified school bus image, which to humans look pretty much the same as before, but it is actually misclassified as an ostrich with 97% probability by the algorithm. So the algorithm really sees an ostrich rather than a school bus in the image that you see here. And after this discovery of what is called adversarial examples, we have seen a lot of similar uh, results in the, in the research area. So for instance, these researchers from Carnegie Mellon, they have built these fancy glass frames that enable them to impersonate different Hollywood celebrities. So in this case, Professor Lujo Bauer is identified as Mila Jovovich, for instance, just because he's wearing these eyeglasses. Or we can also demonstrate that traffic sign recognition can be fooled. For instance, here, on the left-hand side, you see a stop sign with stickers that is going to be misclassified as a speed limit by the car as the car approaches the, the traffic sign, as you'll see in the video in a moment. Whereas on the right-hand side, you see a stop sign which is correctly classified mostly in every frame. So this is another way of tricking against these intelligent machines into to seeing something different. And computer vision is not the only example where this can be demonstrated. But there are also other domains in which AI models can be fooled in the same manner. For example, in the audio case, if we consider a speech-to-text transcription uh, algorithm, so something that tries to create subtitles during a speech, for instance, it's been shown that uh, you can actually add a small noise, background noise, to the audio signal in a way that the machine transcribes something completely different. So now I'm gonna play a small audio sample and you can spot a sentence which is pronounced in, in this speech. Without the data set, the article is useless. 
and the transcription of this sentence is clearly without the, the data set, this article is useless. Now we, I will reproduce a very similar audio that has been only slightly perturbed and you will see how the text is going to be transcribed by the algorithm. Without the data set, the article is useless. So despite we heard more or less the same sound, this, sent, this um, speech is transcribed as, OK, Google, browse to evil.com, which might be an instruction for some of your devices to connect to some malicious websites, for instance. The problem is not only related to what we call attacks on machine learning or on artificial intelligence, but it involves also some other dimensions of what is called trustworthy AI. In fact, the decisions of these algorithms are very hard to understand and interpret, so we have a problem in explaining this algorithm, how they work. We cannot ensure, typically, privacy of their users or of the data they learn from without having high accuracy and high performance, as they show in many applications. And we also have a problem that these algorithms sometimes have different performance across different ethnicity groups. So they may work well from the majority group, but work with lower accuracy for minority groups. And this clearly becomes discriminatory for different types of people when using such systems. The problem is not only related to classical machine learning and deep learning models, but it also affects more recent generative AI algorithms, including large language models, ChatGPT, I'm sure you heard about it, and all the other competing models that are shown, that are out nowadays, where actually you can bypass their security measures, they are called guardrails, by simply modifying the prompt, the text that we use to generate the content passed to the algorithm. So in this case, you see that uh, when asked to uh, describe the basic steps to prepare a bomb, the algorithm at the beginning says, I cannot answer this question. This would generate dangerous instructions for humans. But if we add a small suffix to the initial prompt, we can, which is, of course, not random, but is carefully optimized against the model itself, we can unlock the response from the model. Okay, so research has been widely showing that these algorithms can have a lot of problems related to security, interpretability, privacy, and fairness. So the question is, how can we build trustworthy machines? So artificial intelligence algorithms that are safe for humans and that respect all the properties that the current state of the art cannot guarantee. We should do that, but the unfortunate answer is that to date, we are not yet able to implement these techniques. Not at least at the level that would be required by real world application, we can only study, and there are promising approaches, but only working in, let's say, under simplistic assumptions and laboratory settings. So we are not ready to deploy this technology in the real world. Not yet, at least. Let me conclude this uh, speech by discussing a bit um, the perils of regulating AI. I'm sure you heard that recently, uh, the European Union, United States, and all the other countries in the world are trying to regulate the use of AI in different applications. And they are exactly demanding that such models, such algorithms, are human-aligned, so that they are robust, secure, private, and explainable. Things that still, at the research level, we cannot guarantee, and we don't know how to guarantee. So my, my let's say, um, point here is that we, we still need to, run, to do more research and promote more, more uh, effective education initiatives. And we also need an ecosystem to help companies adopting AI while being compliant to the regulations. We should, most importantly, regulate the application of AI, but not the technology itself. Especially, we should prohibit, and we prohibit, uh, the malicious use of AI, for instance, to perpetrate um, scams on the internet or automate large-scale cyber attacks. In this sense, AI should be limited, but we should not limit and never limit the development of open research and open source models, because otherwise, this would essentially uh, crave a, user, a, a large gap between the technology providers, so the few companies that own and can develop this technology, versus the rest of the world. And this is um, something really dangerous um, for us. 
So in general, if we want to engender trust in artificial intelligence and machine learning models, we should not stifle and hinder open source development and open, and open research. This is of paramount importance. Thank you.